much and it's uh, really nice to see all our all my old friends uh, here at the conference i just wish that um, we'd be able to see each other in person uh, but i do see quite a few names uh, on the uh, list um, that i'm not familiar with actually so i'd better just uh, tell you a little bit about myself um, until recently i was working full-time and i'm now working part-time for a British company called Micros Automation Systems. Um, I just recently handed the company over to my son. In automation, our application areas uh, are, I, I always call it, dirty washing bent cars and gone off food. And by that, I mean, for dirty washing, we specialize in the automation of large commercial laundries. And that takes us all over the world because the equipment is too large to be commissioned in the factory where it's built. So they all have to be commissioned on site. And the equipment is different on every case. So this is uh, a programmer's not exactly nightmare, but fun. And then uh, bent cars, uh, we do automation systems for making stretched formed parts for cars. And we just finished the new Ford Transit, and we're just working on a new electric van at this moment. And then the gone off food is we do automation systems for machines that test for things like salmonella in processed foods. And uh, so there's three apparently quite different application areas. Uh, the one thing that they all hold in common is that you need to be doing lots and lots of things simultaneously. Our preferred programming language for all these things is fourth and has been for many years. So I've been coming to this conference for goodness, probably about 20 years now or something like that. Now, a couple of years ago, um, I did a paper um, about extending the concept of values in fourth. And I said that really we needed to stop using the word variable and start using for preference the word value. And I extended that by um, introducing indexed values, matrix values, um, string indices, and introducing value based fields for structures. And uh, at the time that I made the presentation, there were words available to do this, which actually worked. And then a few of you started asking me for source code. And I looked at my, I, I gave out the source code and then I started looking at it and I realized that it wasn't quite as pretty as I originally thought it was. So what I'm gonna talk about in this little paper is how I went through the code and started to refine it a little bit. So the code as it looked like, uh, you'll, you'll need to maximize this, I should think. Uh, the code as it looked like um, a couple of years ago looks like this. And there are two string, string index words, as you can see. Uh, one for defining in the source code, um, that's strindex there. And uh, the, the word at the bottom there, Z strindex, is where you specify the name of the word um, as a zero terminated string, and that is used for dynamic creation of uh, string indices. Uh, you may also recall a paper I did um, about uh, how to uh, replace uh, the Windows registry, and uh, we replaced that with a database, and we uh, import words from a database table and use those to create, dynamically create um, fourth words from entries in the database table. And one of the sets that we needed there was index strings. Okay, so that's what it looked like a couple of years ago. And I thought um, I was really quite clever because it looked quite nice there. The first thing I, I liked about it is that there was a logical separation of the operations so you create a new indexed string and then you use it in code 
that's the compilation action at the top, or you use it interactively, and that's the one down uh, a little bit below that, which I haven't shown in full because it's very similar to the compiled code, but of course it just isn't postponed inside. The other thing I thought was quite quite good about that is uh, that the modifiers, things like vmod fetch and things like that, are enumerated. Um, this uh, concept, of course, is all uh, based on the original VFX implementation of uh, both values and local values. And so I enumerated these, and uh, then I had actually a terrible shock because I don't know whether the standards committee has had a look at this in the last couple of days. Uh, I came across the fact that as far as I can see, there is no enumerate word in the fourth standard. And hopefully somebody will do something about that sometime because we use enumerations all over the place in our code and they're really, really useful. So um, basically they're there to eliminate magic numbers in the code. Then the other thing I thought was really quite good was that all values were initialized. So when you create a new index string, it's full of null strings. So if you read the string, you've actually got a valid string. And then the other thing I thought was quite nice is I've used this uh, new notation of double square brackets to go into postpone mode instead of having to do postpone, postpone, postpone all the time. And I think that made the code a lot tidier. So I thought that was really quite good and indeed it does work. But then I started thinking about it and I realized that there were some really bad points about this code. And the first thing was that there was no index checking. So you could try to write a string to uh, an index value which actually didn't exist in the array. There were no string length checks, so you could write a string which was longer than the space available. Um, the next problem was that data was close to code because we'd used um, the word a lot just in there. And in general, one doesn't want to put data close to code these days. Now, I'm not a great expert at these things, but my understanding of the reason for this um, is that modern CPUs have these sort of dual cache arrangements, and there are separate caches for code and data. And if these two caches happen to overlap, then that triggers a reload of the cache every time you do an instruction. And this makes the thing run much, much more slow slowly. So I'm told by a factor of up to seven or something like that. So ideally, one wants to move the data away from the code. And then there's this uh, horrible uh, definition for size of there, which uh, uses uh, this word, which I wish I'd never noticed, um, IP to NFA, uh, which basically takes um, an address in the code and moves back to uh, the name field of the definition. And it's a really unpleasant word because um, one of the things you can't do is uh, if you separate the data and code, you actually can't get back to the name. So those were the bad things which I wanted to deal with. Uh, so the first thing to address was index checking. And actually, I would already implemented this, uh, and I think I demonstrated it uh, last time in uh, vindex and vmatrix, for example. So this is the basic index check word, uh, which you can uh, use uh, for the um, string index as well. But then I thought, well, that's not terribly good either, because I'd written this index word for readability. And I used a low value in the index word. But of course, you are actually executing this word every time you do a read or write to a string index. And so efficiency is important. Um, what happens 
when um, you're actually out, you've got an invalid index, just uh, taking account of the check there. And I uh, disassembled um, the resulting VI check word and had a look at how the VFX optimizer dealt with it. And then I rewrote it uh, to use the dreaded word, you know, pick and this kind of thing, which normally one doesn't one wants to avoid using. But it turns out that the optimizer um, makes a far better job of it if you do not use uh, local values. So we use we do use local values an awful lot in our code, our higher level code. But in this case, where we're at a, a re relatively low level, uh, it turns out it would be a lot better actually not to use local values. So then we moved on to what to do about uh, string length checking. And uh, so we recover the length of the string available and then do a little um, um, if we've got a string overflow and uh, at the moment um, if you sort of a buffer overflow like that uh, we regard that as a fatal error which means that the program actually stops in a more or less controlled way before it's wrecked itself um, it would actually be better um, if what you did was to truncate the string that you're trying to store. Um, now, I haven't done that at the moment because I thought, well, a fourth conference needs to have something to talk about, you know, at the quiet moments. And so uh, there's an awful lot of terribly clever people here. So I'm inviting um, suggestions as to how we, we would do tidily um, string truncation has to turn that fatal into a mere one of the things to bear in mind is that the input string might not belong to you so you can't fiddle with the index with with the input string it might actually belong to some other function which sort of owns it so hopefully later on in this conference we will resolve that issue as well so now we include the checks um, in the child compilation strindex comp comma. And now we've what we've done is we've separated the address calculation so that it's external there. And I check that on the optimizer as well. And although that looks quite a complicated little form there, dot cell plus fetch one plus rot and all the rest of it the VFX optimizer actually munches that down to only eight opcodes, which is remarkable, really. So that's put the uh, checks back in. Uh, now we need to address the problem of separated data. And I did this in two stages. Uh, now, the way VFX deals with separated data is it has a word called um, I reserve. And what that basically does is it moves the dictionary pointer up by an amount which is greater than the size of the cache. Uh, so you've got a hole in your, in your code and it issues you with addresses from that hole up to the size which it has available and then if it runs out of space then it does another makes another hole in the code so uh, i extended that actually the uh, the basic i reserve word in vfx doesn't erase for you but um, i just added another one which which does and i've also extended it there uh, so that uh, we allocate enough space to allow for either zero or one based indexing and of course, to allow for the zero, zero terminator at the end of the string. So that's modified now to do separated data. And now we use that in a, a, a changed version of the string length checking. And there it is, uh, all good. Um, except that 
If you look in that code there, you'll see that in both cases, in the string length checking and in the calculation of the address, we have two fetches. Um, for example, in the SL check there, it's over fetch, cell plus fetch. And the first fetch of those, unfortunately, is reading from the code area, not from the data area. And so that, of course, in itself would result in a uh, capital fetch problem. So I thought then, how can we get round this? And the basic difficulty is, um, the how do you get back to the name field from the code address when you've got separated data? So uh, the, the way I thought to do this was when you're doing a reserve to actually add a secret cell is what I've called it. And you can see there, um, I'm reserving an extra cell when um, I'm asked to do a, a, a reserve there. And I re return the address of the next cell along. Then uh, a little bit later, down there in Strindex new B, we've now got to, the new word now has to be separated because there's some things that we have to do before the create and some things we have to do after the create. And you can see there, we now use control to NFA and find the latest, uh, latest gives you the latest, the word you're actually compiling at the moment. So you find the, the name field and then put that in the secret cell. And actually, since I prepared this presentation, um, it seemed to me that uh, it would actually be better to do that transparently uh, during the I reserve and erase. Um, uh, no, as it turned out, you actually you actually can't do that because you have to uh, do the I reserve and erase before you do the create. And the reason for doing for that is because the I reserve may create, may need to create an extra hole in the code instead of using a hole which is already there. Okay. So we put the secret cell in there and now we rewrite the index check and the string length check to use the secret cell and now you can see we've got rid of the double fetch problem. And uh, so hopefully none of this uh, would overlap code and data. And therefore we shouldn't get any cache reload problems. Fingers crossed. So there we are. That's the end of the presentation. And just to remind you, um, if you would like to contribute to this by suggesting how we tidily um, compress, uh, truncate our string to avoid a fatal error in the event of buffer overflow, that would be much appreciated. So, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Are there any questions? If there are any questions on Twitch, please type away. We will try to rel relay them. Are there any questions in Big Blue Button to Nick? Stephen. Um, Nick, beautiful preservation presentation on what iReserve does, um, but doesn't buffer colon do everything that you want? Oh, no, no, because buffer, you see, uh, it doesn't um, implement, it, buffer is not a value type thing. You can't do two to a buffer. Buffer is right. a sample, but not a citation of length. It's not okay. Fair. Okay, so did, why didn't you just steal the innards of buffer code? Well, I, I have in, in <laughs> several ways. I have okay. in several ways. I've actually got a new string word as well, in addition to buffer, which is similar to buffer, but does support um, the to word and the, and the side of word. Now, it, it's just I suggested buffer colon because it actually does the arrays for you. Oh, does it? Oh, okay. It, well, it, it, it does. It does the arrays and it creates a constant. 
Yeah, yeah, and yes, yes. I've used constant in the code in other places, um, actually. Yeah. But using using constants instead is actually yeah. much more efficient. Yeah. yeah. I've actually, I guess, as a result of this, I've got this new string word now. So I have probably removed about ninety-five percent of the word buffer from the code now, because most of the most of the buffers actually did contain strings. What? Constant strings? No, 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 no. Not constant strings, no. Um, variable, string variables. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any further questions? Andrew? So, Nick, oh, uh, yeah, you, you, you're mentioning the performance of things. I'm wondering, are you inferring your performance from the length of the optimized code. You mentioned VFX was doing a great job there of shrinking some to eight instructions. Or do you have some tool for measuring kind of the speed? Well, there, there, there are two performance issues, issues that I looked at there. Um, the, the issue of um, cache reload. And I'm quoting basically from the literature. I, I certainly haven't tested any of this uh, myself. Uh, but according to the literature, um, if you stringently avoid overlap of code and data, you get a significant performance improvement by a multiple factor, apparently. And then uh, the issue of uh, looking at what the optimizer actually produces, um, it's clear that if you do the same thing using complicated things like rot and dash rot and pick and all the rest of it, uh, the VFX compiler makes mincemeat of stuff like that. Whereas inevitably, if you start using local values, um, the VFX compiler obviously has to create the stack frame to put the values in and then clear up afterwards. So inevitably, this, this produces um, a lot more opcodes than just plain doing picks and rots and things like that. Stephen has something to reply to that. Stephen, do you have a quick reply before we take the other questions? Well, I, it was mostly, we, we did actually measure the, the impact of separation on the code data separation. Then we did the benchmark code. Um, and in the worst case, which was for a single repeated fetch near the start of an area, it was 14 to 1 was the performance penalty. Yeah, it, sounds, that, it, that it looks to me as though That was on 32-bit x86 code. I haven't repeated the measurement on, on x on 64-bit. OK. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Anton, you've had a question? Um, on, on that same topic, I have um, my latest measurement was that if you do basically store into some code area and then execute the code um, and then uh, access the area as, um, as data again that's uh, a round trip it's uh, 400 cycles on some um, somewhat recent cpu i, I measured um, as about um, the inevitableness of um, of being uh, slow when using locals that's uh, dependent on the fourth system implementation. So um, the Peter Feld uh, has one where uh, he actually manages to put the locals into registers and basically he, he gets more or less very similar code whether you uh, keep the data uh, in on, on the data stack, on the return stack, or in locus. Hmm. I'm, I'm surprised at that, actually, because inevitably, if you use locals, there is some code that you need to put at the beginning to put the locals into somewhere. And then inevitably, there's something to tidy up afterwards. So it's, it's in, it is bound to add opcodes to the end result. No, he, he keeps it all in registers, so um, yeah, <laughs> just, just try his system. So it's LXF uh, on Linux oh. and 
MTF on Windows. Yes. Okay. okay, thanks for that. I think you sparked a discussion because I see Stephen's hand up again. <laughs> well, it's just that the um, this is all critically dependent on how many free registers you've got on uh, even on 64-bit x64. X um, you can, you can choose probably up to a maximum of four items from our the return stack in the local frame to stash in registers. But that's all. Um, if you really want to go, if you really want, want to do more than that, you're going to have to go to 32 registers. Um, and, and then we're in ARM64 land, but for which watch this space. But yeah, you know, there, there, there are only, only 70 hours in the day. 